A South Korean designer claims to have invented an oxygen mask which can draw air from water as you swim. Called Triton, the mask is a mouthpiece respirator that allows users to breathe underwater simply by biting on the mouthpiece. Triton is a gill system that allows you to breathe underwater just like a fish. It's got microlithium batteries. The compressor is powered by a micro battery that is supposedly 30 times smaller than its contemporaries but charges a thousand times faster. It's got filters that allow the oxygen through, but not the water. It's so cool. It's just like that James Bond thingy. It's sleek, it's sexy, it's shiny. And I got so many requests to debunk this bullshit. The first thing is there really isn't that much oxygen in water. I mean, let me just take two identical one liter pot bottles. The one on the left contains air, which is essentially a mixture of about 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. Oxygen's the important one, because if you don't get that, you die. So the bottle containing air only has about 200 milliliters of oxygen in it. Now that might not seem much until you consider that the bottle of water only contains about five to 10 milliliters equivalent of oxygen. Remember, mammals, unlike fish, can actually drown in water. Yet some of the most successful and largest aquatic animals are still mammals. Indeed, currently the largest toothed predator on Earth is a whale. It can breathe this rocket fuel oxygen from the atmosphere and then dive a couple of kilometers down into the water, at which point their local life has access to only a tiny fraction of the oxygen that the whale has access to. And there it essentially has Well, unlimited power compared to the locals. So yeah, if you could breathe water instead of air. Triton is the lethal to find solutions for an innovative breathing system in the water. You would have to breathe about 10 to 20 times faster in water than air. That's just to keep you alive. And seeing as casual breathing is about 10 liters per minute, that's about 10 of these means that to get that from the water, you would have to breathe about 100 liters of water per minute. That's the minimum amount of water you would have to put through these artificial gills. I mean, let me just put this into perspective. 100 liters of water in a minute. That's 1.7 liters per second. It has to fill about two of these bottles in one second half a second per bottle. And my tap, when it's on full, takes about six seconds to fill just one of these bottles. So you need a flow about 10 times of what's going through this tap is the flow rate you need going through those gills for it to work. And that's assuming that you've got 100% oxygen extraction from this water. And just a pump that could do that sort of flow rate weighs about two kilos, four pounds or so, and runs off 100 watts. Our micro battery is a modified lithium ion battery that allows us to swim on the water with the Triton, maximum 45 minutes. So to pump water for 45 minutes, eh, call it an hour, means you need 100 watt hours just to pump the water. And that's assuming 100% efficiency oxygen extraction. You would need something about the size of a hoverboard lithium ion battery just to power this. Now it turns out that your lungs do two things that are really important. They allow you to absorb the oxygen and they allow you to excrete carbon dioxide. Now it might seem counterintuitive, but your body is almost insensitive to oxygen concentrations. It's the carbon dioxide building up in your blood that gives you that urge to breathe. So if you're actually sat in a oxygen poor atmosphere, but can quite happily excrete the carbon dioxide, you just get no warning. You just black out and die. Indeed, it's actually a quite common way for people to drown, even experienced people is they hyperventilate somewhat to increase the oxygen in their blood, which sort of works, but it more effectively clears out the carbon dioxide from their system. 
So it can happen that you just don't feel the need to breathe because the carbon dioxide levels in your blood just haven't gotten high enough yet. But in reality, the oxygen levels can be dangerously low. The practical upshot is it can be possible under those circumstances to just black out and drown. Now, for these reasons, it turns out that carbon dioxide itself is actually quite toxic. Indeed, if you're breathing an atmosphere that contains about 10% of carbon dioxide, you are rendered unconscious fairly quickly and die. Indeed, at this point, I would point you to this great video I had on the subject of crazy Russian hacker tries for a Darwin Award, where he actually advises people to use solid carbon dioxide to make an air conditioner. Apart from he filed a bogus DMCA against it about a week ago. Yeah, who would have thought that after all that Fine Brothers thing that a YouTuber, a popular YouTuber, a professional YouTuber of all people would still be dumb enough to file a DMCA like this. But then again, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. The guy was dumb enough to try and make an air conditioner from solid carbon dioxide. Well, anyway, I filed the counter notice, so I guess shortly we'll see if YouTube is as eager to give out account strikes for baseless copyright infringement accusations as it is to give out account strikes for DMCA abuse. Now, the need to get that carbon dioxide out of your system and to get oxygen into it has long been known to divers, which led to the first rebreather system. You see, when you're breathing normally, you breathe in the air and you absorb about 25% of the oxygen and you excrete a sort of comparable amount of carbon dioxide and you're done. But that means of what you're breathing out, about 75% of it is the original unaffected oxygen. And that's sort of how scuba kits work. Sure, you're throwing away about 75% of your original oxygen, but it's also carrying away the carbon dioxide. It's a relatively simple and safe system. However, that waste got people thinking that if you had a closed system where you actually chemically absorb that carbon dioxide, then you wouldn't have to throw away that 75% of the oxygen. Plus, it wouldn't make any bubbles, which led to the rebreather kit, which is now the breathing kit of choice for the military. Because if you're going to lay mines under somebody else's ships, the last thing you want is a load of bubbles coming up, alerting the enemy to your actions. Now, the downside to these closed circuit systems, especially in the early days, is they were much more dangerous because they used chemicals like potassium superoxide, which were great in that when they absorb carbon dioxide, they release oxygen. The downside is, though, that if they got wet, which in scuba terms is maybe a, a, a hazard to worry about, they would get very hot and give off caustic vapours. And that's very bad news if that's the only oxygen you've got to breathe. And while that still can happen, it's much rarer than it was in the early, more primitive versions of these kits. The modern versions are much safer and widely used. And indeed, in systems that must be closed, like spacesuits, they're essential. Now, that's an exciting moment. Opening the hatch, it's a 240-mile drop, so don't let go. Which brings us to the really weird thing about this kit. Why is it called a rebreather? It makes no sense whatsoever. The minimum size for a rebreather kit is the volume of your lungs. Because when you breathe out, that gas has to go somewhere. Which means that the minimum size of a rebreather kit is about the volume of your lungs. Which is significantly larger than this kit. And at this point, you just gotta be honest. This is not actually a gill or a rebreather kit at all. It's a couple of BMX handlebars glued to a respirator mouthpiece, which is why you never see the guy breathe out more than a full lungful when he's swimming with it. And just so you know, this is a one liter gas bottle. It can hold up to about 100 atmospheres of pressure. In practice, that means if you were to fill a bottle like this with air, it would hold about 100 liters of air. That's enough to keep you going underwater for about 10 minutes. Which brings us on to their microfiltration. The oxygen is then extracted by a filter with fine threads and holes smaller than water molecules. The excess liquid is then released. To which the answer is simply no. No. No, 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 no. Firstly, it's impossible. 
oxygen molecules are bigger than water molecules. So how can you have the big molecules going through the filter, but the small ones won't? I mean, this would be like getting a tea strainer and expecting the leaves to go through the filter, but have the water stay in the tea strainer. Then there's the simple practicality. You'll recall that you might have a flow rate of water about 10 times this going through this kit. Well, that might be possible if you're just pumping water, but not if you're going to put it through a filter too. The nearest analogy would be reverse osmosis, where you apply pressure to, say, salt water, and water goes through, but the salt doesn't. But as many of you will know, reverse osmosis is a bloody expensive way of purifying your water, because it takes a lot of energy to force the water through that membrane. Indeed, even using modern kit, it takes about three kilowatt hours to purify one ton of water. So that would be about three watt hours per kilo. And you need to run 100 kilos per minute through this, which means just to run this sort of kit for just one minute would require about two hoverboard batteries. And that's assuming it can be done at all, because, you know, the oxygen's bigger than the water. As for their claims about using this hyper-efficient micro-lithium battery, the compressor is powered by a micro battery that is supposedly 30 times smaller than its contemporaries, but charges a thousand times faster. Nah, that's just bullshit on so many levels. Firstly, if you had a battery that was that much more efficient than current lithium-ion batteries, the last thing you would need would be an Indiegogo campaign, because you could just sell that patent to any mobile phone or computer battery manufacturer in the world for a blank check. And even if by some miracle this was possible, you still have to get the gas extracted by the earth gill to the correct pressure. Otherwise, you won't be able to breathe it in because a fraction of an atmosphere higher and it will either just blow out of your mouth or burst your lungs. And a fraction of an atmosphere lower and you just won't be able to suck the oxygen out at all. That's what all the regulator stuff is about on your regular scuba kit. The most important obviously being the primary uh, second stage regulator which uh, drops the pressure down again to the surrounding water pressure. Again, it's just really painful to watch something which is obviously bullshit get funded to the tune of about a million dollars, especially on the back of projects like solar roadways. It's technology that replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with solar panels. And not just lifeless, boring solar panels, smart microprocessing, interlocking, hexagonal solar units. Which about a year after getting their $2 million were doing things like this. You know, seeing if solar panels get more energy when they're flat or angled. Something that's been known since people first started using solar cells. Something that I managed to replicate in my bedroom with a solar panel from a local hardware store in about 20 minutes. Okay, so this is a really crude example. So I've got my solar cell hooked up to a multimeter and to an electrolysis cell. So basically, the more juice it produces, the more bubbles you're going to get here. So this is just an example of what it's like when the cell is flat. And what you'll see is, as I raise the angle up, the volts go up, and the number of bubbles go up, till we get to, you know, an angle which is basically pointing directly at the sun, which is when you get the most out of your solar panel. As I lie it down again, which you'll find is you get nowhere near as much out of it. And that took them over a year. The format of these things is sort of emerging as a fairly clear pattern. You get some bullshit and promote the hell out of it on old media, whose science correspondents just don't have a clue about what it is they're actually reporting on and are effectively just acting as promotional tools for this bullshit. And then, you just watch the suckers empty their wallets. And as it turns out, this was a bogus idea about two years ago. And look at all the revolutionary changes it's undergone since its initial release in 2014. Yeah, I mean, just look at all this promotion by scientific communicators. 
It can't be bullshit, right? Actually, in this case, I've got to give them partial credit. About half of the people who actually they, they cite here as featuring their product expressed doubts about its viability. But yeah, for the large part, now science communicator just means someone who basically reports anything a bullshit artist wearing a lab coat says. By simply replacing your engine with a system that runs on thorium, one of the densest materials known to man, you'll only need to refuel once a century. You may think it's too good to be true, but here I am, sitting on the proof. This chair is made from air carbon, a material that's doing its part to protect the Earth's ever-warming climate. Has anyone seen this video for solar freaking roadways? Yeah! Yeah! I have seen the future, and it is solar freaking roadways. Hey everyone, Lacey here with Vanessa Hill of PBS's BrainCraft. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course, thanks for joining me. There are a lot of people with opinions about gender, but today we science, and I hear you do some sciencing now and then, Vanessa. You could say that. So if there's no such thing as a female or a male brain then, what's going on with differences that we see in people's behavior? So the differences we see in people's behavior are mostly a result of our environment and not our biology. Mm. Fire up the engines, they pull the supports down, so this stays completely in the same place, but there's all this magnitude magnetism that's saving everybody while the earth is shaking wildly under it. The earth is like, okay, I'm done. The supports come back up, everything's good. So we were like, of course, you could probably with a million engines lift anything, but that's gotta cost a fortune. $13.10. What's your dream car? Something fast, sleek, fuel efficient? Well, mine is all of those and it runs on salt water. Indeed, I'm now almost contemptuous of the name science communicator, because more often than not, they just end up because of their lack of even the most rudimentary scientific understanding of the subjects they're meant to be reporting on, being pseudoscientific bullshit promoters who just end up undermining the credibility of real scientists. 